In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus is quite often a lightning rod. Whenever there's any controversy, whether it's ancient or modern, people always seem to want to drag Jesus into it. And, unsurprisingly, no matter what side it is of any debate, everyone wants to claim that Jesus would be on their side. Immigration policy? Of course Jesus would side with me. State budget priorities? Jesus would definitely take my side. Education reform? What would Jesus teach? Usually, people want to put words into Jesus' mouth so that they can make him agree with their own human ideas. We have something like that in our Gospel reading for today, but with a little bit of a twist. The Pharisees of Jerusalem had heard enough. They heard Jesus' parables about the vineyard and the wedding feast, which we ourselves have heard the last two weeks. And they knew that he was speaking these parables about them. They were sick of it. They wanted to get rid of this problematic carpenter from Nazareth, and so they figured out how to trap him. It's actually quite a clever trap. They'd ask him a question that was both political and religious. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar, the Roman emperor ruling over Jerusalem, or not? But to make the trap work, they would send representatives from both sides of the debate. The Pharisees would send their own disciples to represent Hebrew interests. And they would send the Herodians, those faithful to Herod, the puppet king set up by Caesar himself. So no matter how Jesus answered, there would be a side that could attack. If he said, yes, it's lawful, then the disciples of the Pharisees could strike with the objections that most faithful Jews shared about giving money to a pagan despot who had despoiled the promised land of their forefather Abraham. And if he said, no, it's not lawful, well, then the Herodians could accuse him of treason against Herod and Caesar. It was an elegant trap. The Pharisees send their disciples to go and ensnare this troublemaker. First, they try to butter him up, a tactic that we're all very familiar with. Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God truthfully, and you do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances. You can almost hear both the Herodians and the Pharisees in training hold their breath as the question is finally revealed. Tell us then, what do you think? Here it was, the final trap, the demise of Jesus of Nazareth. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? The anticipation was killing them. Which would he answer, yes or no? It didn't matter. They had him trapped either way. It was over, finally. They licked their lips as they waited for his answer, waiting to spring into action. But Jesus, aware of their malice, knowing their evil, said, Why do you put me to the test, you hypocrites? Something was wrong. Had they overlooked something? Was there any way that he could get out of it that they hadn't taken into account? Then Jesus made his play. Show me the coin for the tax. They brought him a denarius. It was the coin that was most often paid for a day's honest wages. 
It also happened to be the coin demanded for the tax to Caesar. He asked them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? The answer was obvious. Caesar's face was staring right back at them from the coin, so they answered, Caesar's. And Jesus' reply would not only avoid their little elegant trap, it would break it into pieces. Give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. The trap was shattered. God does not think like fallen human beings. Jesus cannot be entrapped with our little logic snares. With these words from Jesus, the truth falls from heaven like a thunderbolt and obliterates all human pretensions. Give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. It's so simple, so beautiful. The things of this world, the things to which worldly authorities, governments, and the like, can lay claim are to be given to them. Whose inscription is on the dollar bill? The United States of America. Give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. If it has the government's name on it, give it to the government. If God has told you that, they, that you owe them something, taxes, revenue, respect, or honor, as the fourth commandment demands, then you must give these authorities taxes, revenue, respect, and honor. These are the authorities established by the Lord himself, no matter if you like them or not, no matter if you agree with them or not. Jesus himself tells us to give to them the things that are theirs. In our, in our gospel reading today, he tells the Hebrews to give to Caesar, the Roman emperor who bows down at pagan altars, to give to Caesar the things that are his the things that they owe him. As Scripture declares, let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. Pay to all what is owed to them. Now, the Pharisees, and if we're being honest with ourselves, we must certainly number ourselves among them from time to time. The Pharisees have no leg to stand on in resisting paying taxes, honor, or respect to Caesar. God established the Roman Empire, and he gave Israel into Rome's hands. Now, it's often hard for us to accept this fact, but God is fully in control of every aspect of history. There, in the rise and fall of nations and rulers, nothing is outside of his control. He doesn't simply sit back and watch the world run its course, hoping that it will fall in line with what he wants to happen. No, he causes things to unfold as he wills. As he said in our Old Testament reading, he is the God who gives well-being and creates calamity. Now this could be a terrifying thing. Whenever something that we believe to be bad happens, whenever history seems to us to be going in the wrong direction, we might be tempted to think that God isn't in control. Or worse, we might think that he's wrong. Sinful mortals are often tempted to try to take the reins themselves and decide what would be better. And thus we end up with people committing evil acts against those whom God has established in worldly offices of authority. 
acts like rebellion and murder. It could be frightening to know that God is running things against our will, that we might believe that the world is spinning out of control by his design, that he's just distant and uncaring and he's pulling all the wrong strings. It would be scary if we did not know the true God. But we do. In his Son, God has made himself known to us fully and perfectly. And when we're tempted to think that he's doing the wrong thing, we still have his sure and certain word that it's for our good even if we can't see it or understand it at the time. Listen again to our Old Testament reading. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped, to subdue nations before him and to loose the belts of kings, to open doors before him that gates may not be closed. I will go before you and level exalted places. I will break in pieces the doors of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and the hordes of the secret places, that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who call you by your name. For the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel my chosen, I call you by name, though you do not know me. I am the Lord and there is no other. The Lord was speaking to Cyrus, the king of Persia, who would rule a century after this prophecy. God would crush kingdoms like the mighty Babylon using Cyrus for the sake of his people. And that's exactly what he did. He raised up Cyrus, an unbelieving pagan emperor, to destroy the Babylonian empire and return the people of Judah, the ancestors of the coming Messiah, to their promised land. And then, after the empire of Persia fell, the Lord continued to preserve his people through the rule of others throughout the centuries, maintaining order in the world so that the lineage of the Messiah would be preserved. And then, when the time was right, the Lord raised up Caesar Augustus of Rome to impose the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome, so that all roadways in the empire would be guarded and protected by the Roman legions, even those in the backwater province of Judea. And so it was that a lowly carpenter named Joseph and his betrothed Mary could safely travel the roads to Bethlehem where she would give birth to a son and name him Jesus. The Lord establishes and uses worldly temporal authorities for the sake of his people. He keeps peace and order in the world through these worldly authorities so that the church can continue preaching and teaching in peace. So that there's enough stability in our life together so that the faithful people of God can flourish. You are called to give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, to give to the worldly authorities the things due them, taxes, revenue, respect, and honor, so that you would have peace and order in the world to give God the things that are his, faith and hope. Through these earthly authorities, you have stability so that you can show love to your neighbor. You can live quiet and peaceable lives so that you can put your faith in a power higher than Cyrus or Caesar. You can put your faith in the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ. 
But what if Caesar should demand something that is reserved for God alone? What if some worldly authority should demand faith, should demand that you put your hope in them to give you every desire of your heart? Then we, as subjects of the Lord first, do not lift a finger to comply. We don't rebel, we don't overthrow, for that's an authority set up by God. But we also don't allow Caesar to claim the things that are God's. Things like faith, worship, the expectation of redemption, these are things that are to be rendered to God alone. Give to Caesar only the things that are Caesar's, and give only to God the things that are rightfully his. Do not be tempted to force Jesus to take your side in any debate when dealing with the controversies of this world. Just as he showed the Pharisees and the Herodians, he will likely show you how short-sighted you're being. Rather, listen to his word. Hear again of the marvelous ways that he has preserved his people through the ages, through the rise and fall of nations and empires, how he has done everything for the sake of his chosen people, his bride, his church. Ask for forgiveness when you reject what he has established for your good. Remember that when he took his throne on the wood of the cross, when he was coronated with a crown of thorns, that he was establishing a kingdom of forgiveness and mercy that will outlast every nation and empire of this world. And that gives us peace, knowing that no matter how tumultuous things might seem, no matter what we think of these fleeting worldly institutions, that there is one thing that outlasts them all, the everlasting kingdom of grace, the kingdom of forgiveness, the kingdom of eternal life found only in the life and death of our own crucified King. In the name of Jesus, who rules everything for our good. Amen.